Welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gizella Kay, and today we're going to be looking at this portion here of the latest document in the Delphi case. Now what I'm going to do after reading this portion is I'm going to link in afterwards the entire document in case you missed it the first time round. If you've never heard of this case or if you want to catch up, please check out my playlist in the description box below. So let's read through this now where they say, Charges were filed against Richard M. Allen on October 28, 2022 for two counts of murder. Once Richard M. Allen was taken into custody, he was moved to the Westville Correctional Facility, which is part of the Indiana Department of Corrections for safekeeping. He's been moved a few times. He's been in said facility, though there, since November of 2022. When Richard M. Allen entered the facility, he was placed in the segregation unit for his protection. In the segregation unit, his cell is equipped with a video recorder, which records his activities within the cell. That must be scary to see. Okay. There are also logs indicating when Richard M. Allen leaves the cell and for what purposes. He is also being seen by medical providers and mental health specialists to evaluate his physical condition and monitor his mental health. Richard M. Allen also has the ability to use a tablet in his cell to send text messages, make phone calls and listen to music. Upon Richard M. Allen's arrival to the facility, he was placed on suicide watch because of certain statements he made about harming himself. Throughout his stay, his mental health improved to the point that he was taken off of suicide watch. He was also participating in recreation time and beginning to exercise. The facility reports that he was doing well and that they had no issues or concerns. His day-to-day -day demeanor was that he was quiet, read a lot of books, did crossword puzzles and exercised daily. On April 3rd, 2023, Richard M. Allen made a phone call. That's really not long ago. April 3rd, 2023, Richard M. Allen made a phone call to his wife, Kathy Allen. In that phone call, Richard M. Allen admits several times, not just once, not a fleeting moment, admits several times that he killed Abby and Libby. Investigators had the phone call transcribed and the transcription confirms that Richard M. Allen admits that he committed the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. He admits several times within the phone call that he committed the offenses as charged. His wife, Kathy Allen, ends the phone call abruptly. Soon after, attorneys for Richard M. Allen filed an emergency motion to modify safekeeping order. In that motion, the defense states that Richard M. Allen's mental state has declined because Westville Correctional Facility is unfit and that he should be moved. The defense also makes allegations that his mental health has declined to the point where Richard M. Allen has been deprived of his constitutional right to assist in his defense of this case. Further, the defense alleges that his mental capacity has declined because of his incarceration at Westville Correctional Facility. The defense has also challenged that his treatment is unconstitutional. Soon after, investigators were made aware by the warden of Westville Correctional Facility that Richard M. Allen began to act strangely. I feel like I'm doing this face because I'm like, that's what they always do, not. <laughs> yes, Paula says, I want to hear that call. I'm sure that'll be played at the trial, right? So, Richard M. Allen was wetting down paperwork he had gotten from his attorneys and eating it. He was refusing to eat and refusing to sleep. He would go days on end refusing to sleep. He further broke the tablet that he used for text messages and phone calls. He went from making up to two phone calls a day as of April 3rd, 2023 to not making any phone calls at all. To date, Richard M. Allen still has not made a phone call since April 3rd, 2023. On April 14th, 2023, Richard M. Allen was evaluated by two psychiatrists and one psychologist to discuss his turn in behavior and whether or not there was a need for involuntary medication. The panel would also discuss moving Richard M. Allen to a different facility that has a psychiatric unit. From that meeting, it was determined that Richard M. Allen did not need involuntary medication and that he did not need to be moved to another facility. Since that meeting, Richard M. Allen has begun to eat again and begun to sleep. His behavior has begun to return to what it was prior to making the admission on April 3, 2023. Investigators believe the information that Westville Correctional Facility has gathered since Richard M. Allen was placed in that facility is important to the investigation. 
Investigators believe that there is video evidence that will include his admissions, plus his behavior prior to the admission and directly after. Investigators also believe logs kept of his daily routines are important to determine when he was in his cell and when he was removed and the reasons he was removed. Further, any records of physical exams and or mental exams will be important to determine the state of his mental and physical health. This information is needed to refute the allegations made in the defense's emergency motion to modify safekeeping order. The evidence is also necessary to refute the allegations of diminished mental capacity and other possible defenses. Ah, so other possible defenses. We kind of saw that, right? It may also be important as the state introduces additional evidence gathered, including admissions made by Richard M. Allen himself. Investigators believe all the information is important in the continued investigation for the murder of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. For the, these reasons, the state is requesting the employment records for Richard Allen as specified in the attached subpoena duces tecum and or request for production of documents and records to a non-party. This request is made for the purpose of an investigation regarding murder. Further, in response to the observations made by the investigating officer, the state believes that Richard Allen is a suspect in the criminal acts. A suspect in the criminal acts. The state believes that the employment records would be able to confirm or support information that the law enforcement has acquired as a result of the murder investigation. The state of Indiana has contacted the defense counsel for Richard Allen and defense counsel has not informed me whether they consent or object to the subpoenas. The state of Indiana has also sent them a courtesy copy of the subpoena by email. Wherefore, the state of Indiana, by Nicholas C. McClellan, prosecuting attorney for the 74th Judicial Circuit, respectfully prays that this court review the attached subpoena and then order production of said records and such other relief as is just and proper in the premises and signed so we've got that and just if we just I just want to see the sentence up here again wait not there not there page six yes charge was filed we've got that I'm looking for this April 3rd Richard M. Allen made a phone call to his wife in that phone call he admits several times that he killed him so that is very interesting because all along We've kind of thought, and I mean like public, public opinion. I know it varies, but if you look at it as a spectrum, it's kind of like the middle point would be, okay, that he could be bridge guy. He could be the down the hill guy. He could have led them to the demise. But here he's admitting to his wife that he killed Abby and Libby. Now, I still do wonder if there's more involved than if he's just like over it. He's just like, I'm, I'll just, yeah, you know, but he hasn't, he hasn't pleaded guilty. And this is still going to trial. I just wonder if he will plead guilty. It's another one. Another one of those. We've said this in many cases <laughs> lately. Will he? Will anyone at some point just be like, let me not put the families through this? Then again, I think a trial is probably better to get lots of answers. Because remember how Chris Watts? He was just like, okay, I'm pleading guilty. And then we never got a trial and we never got to learn a lot of information. There's still a lot of questions, right? So... Johnny says, very strange that he lost his mind this year. This whole case will never be clear. I just wonder if it's about telling his wife and that her abrupt ending of, of the phone call, I don't know, made him like, you know, you could just imagine, I don't know, I'm trying to put myself in his shoes for a second, just like that. Almost, it's almost like relief on one hand, if this is now speculation, if he's the guy and he finally confesses to his wife, the relief of finally just saying it could make him act like that <laughs> the way that they're describing and maybe even feel completely abandoned by the one person he's known his whole life because they were college sweethearts you know that it's like oh man she's never going to talk to me again maybe that's why he was acting like that so that's it for this document what i'll do now because we've read um if you were here in the live stream you saw all this go down from the from the top to the bottom if you're watching the video We've read that portion and now I'm going to be linking the rest for you in case you've never seen it before.
All right, so thank you so much. If you are watching this live with me, please like and share with this news. Really appreciate it. So here we go. This is the document everyone's talking about right now. Filed April 20th, 2023. State of Indiana versus Richard M. Allen. Motion for leave of court to subpoena third party records. Comes now the state of Indiana. Do you want me to make it bigger? Hold on. Ah, it's nice, right? <laughs> Comes now the state of Indiana by Nicholas C. McClelland, prosecuting attorney for the 74th Judicial Circuit, and moves this court for an order for Westville Correctional Facility. Attention, Elise Gallagher. To produce the Carroll County Prosecutor's Office. Attention, Nicholas McClelland. And we talk about here, and they say any and all mental health records for Richard Allen, date of birth 9 9 1972. Associated with his stay as an inmate at that facility from November 3rd, 2022 until present. While working the Delphi investigation, Carroll County Sheriff's Department Detective Tony Liggett developed information that Richard Allen was involved in the murders of victim 1 and 2. Oh, this one is 8 pages long. Okay, so just so you know, we're on page 1 of 8. So that Richard Allen was involved in the murders of victim 1 and 2. The investigation shows the following. That on February 14th, 2017, victim 1 and 2 were found deceased in the woods approximately 0.2 miles northeast of the Monon High Bridge in Carroll County. Their bodies were located on the north side of the Deer Creek. At the time, the Monon High Bridge Trail was an approximately one mile gravel trail, terminating at the Monon High Bridge. The Monon High Bridge is an abandoned railroad trestle. Well, now it's been all fixed, Ran. Have you seen it? It looks amazing now. So, they say. The Monon High Bridge is an abandoned railroad trestle approximately 0.25 miles long, spanning the Deer Creek and Deer Creek Valley on the southeast end of the trail, approximately 0.7 miles northwest on the trail from the northwestern edge of the Monon High Bridge is the Freedom Bridge, which is a pedestrian bridge spanning State Road 25. Approximately 350 feet west of Freedom Bridge was a former railroad overpass over Old State Road 25, also known as County Road 300 North. We've done a lot of map time on that if you do want to see it. Okay, it's on the playlist. The tra just look at the timestamps, as always. The trail terminates just west of the former railroad overpass. The majority of the trail is in a wooded area with a steep embankment on the south side of the trail. The entirety of the trail and the location of the girls' bodies were and are located in Carroll County, Indiana. If you want to see videos of where this area is and what it looks like, I would recommend... Hoosier Cold Cases, a YouTube channel. He's done some really great videos of walking the area and even footage of the bridge before it was all changed. Through interviews, reviews of electronic records and review of video at the Hoosier Harvest Store, investigators believe Victim 1 and Victim 2 were dropped off across from the Mears Farm at 1.49pm on February 13, 2017 by Kelsey German. See, it's all like unredacted now. The Mirrors Farm is, we knew that, I just mean it's like, I don't see any redactions here. The Mirrors Farm is located on the north side of County Road 300 near an entrance to the trails. A video from Victim 2's phone shows that at 2.13pm, Victim 1 and 2 encountered a male subject on the southeast portion of the Monon High Bridge. The male ordered the girls, guys, down the hill. No witnesses saw them after this time. No outgoing communications were found on Victim 2's phone after this time. Their bodies were discovered on February 14, 2017. The video recovered from Victim 2's phone shows Victim 1 walking southeast on the Monon High Bridge while a male subject wearing a dark jacket and jeans walks behind her. As the male subject approaches Victim 1 and 2, one of the victims mentions gun. Near the end of the video, a male is seen and heard telling the girls, guys, down the hill. The girls then proceed, begin to proceed down the hill and the video ends. A still photograph taken from the video and the guys down the hill audio was subsequently released to the public to assist in, in to assist investigators in identifying the male. And there were sketches made, two sketches that looked so vastly different from each other, but they said we should put them together, but still I don't know how important um sketches really are in these. Do you think they are? Also, sorry if I missed I missed the super sticker earlier. I will look at it afterwards as well. Thank you so much, Dandy Lioness. Thanks for all you do. I put my Dollars and do things I believe in. Thank you so much, Dandelioners. Okay, to continue on, before someone moans at me and says, just read the document <laughs> without stopping. So I'm going to focus, okay? Victim 1 and Victim 2's deaths were ruled as homicides. Clothes were found in Deer Creek belonging to Victim 1 and 2, south of where their bodies were located. 
There was also a 40 caliber unspent round less than two feet away from victim 2's body, between victim 1 and victim 2's bodies. The round was unspent and had extraction marks on it. Interviews were conducted with three juveniles, RV, BW and AS. They advised that they were on the Monon High Bridge Trail on February 13, 2017. They advised that they were walking on the trail toward Freedom Bridge to go home when they encountered a male walking from Freedom Bridge toward the Monon High Bridge. AS described the male as kind of creepy and advised he was wearing like blue jeans, a really light blue jacket, and he and his hair was gray, maybe a little brown, and he did not really show his face. She, ad I wonder then why they told us reddish brown, you know? Thank you, brain. She advised the jacket was a duck canvas type jacket. RV advised that she said hi to the male, but he just glared at them. She recalled being him being in all black and had something covering his mouth. This is from the probable cause affidavit, right? She described him as not very tall with a bigger build. She said he was not bigger than five foot ten. RV advised that he was wearing a black hoodie, black jeans, and black boots. She stated that he had his hands in his pockets. BW showed investigators photographs that she took on her phone while she was on the trail that day. The photographs included a photo of the Monon High Bridge taken at 12.43 p.m. and another one taken at 1.26 p.m. of the bench east of Freedom Bridge. BW advised after she took the photo of the bench that they started walking back toward Freedom Bridge. She advised that was when they encountered the man who matched the description of the photograph taken from victim 2's video. BW described the man she encountered on the trail as wearing a blue or black windbreaker jacket. She advised the jacket had a collar and he had his hood up from the clothing underneath his jacket. She advised that he was wearing baggy jeans and he was taller than her. She advised that her head came up to approximately his shoulder. She advised that RV said hi to the man and that he said nothing back. She stated that he was walking with a purpose, like he knew where he was going. She stated that he had his hands in his pockets and he kept his head down. She advised that she did not get a good look at his face, but believed him to be a white male. The girls advised, after encountering the male, they continued their walk across Freedom Bridge and the old railroad bridge over the old State Road 25. Investigators spoke with Betsy Blair, who advised that she was on the trails on February 13th, 2017. That's new, I think. Betsy Blair, wouldn't know her before. I think that was redacted before. Carrie Summers says, thank you for your hard work, G. I know you have to pay for these documents. I didn't actually for this. This is all now public, but thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. Sometimes I do. These, not so much. <laughs> but thank you very much. So, to continue on. I know that there's a lot of this that we've heard before, and some of it we haven't. So, this is page three of eight of this document, which is one of many documents. So, we're going to have to work through all of them at some point. I'm just showing you this one right now that's going around. Okay. So, they say, investigators spoke with yeah, Betsy Blair, who advised that she was on the trails on February 13th, 2017. Video from the Hoosier Harvest Store captured Betsy's vehicle traveling eastbound at 1.46 p.m. toward the entrance from the Mears Farm. Betsy advised that she saw four juvenile females walking on the bridge over Old State Road 25 as she was driving underneath on her way to park. Betsy advised that there were no other cars parked across from the Mears Farm when she parked. She advised she walked to the Monon High Bridge and observed a male matching the one from Victim 2's video. She described the male that she saw as a white male wearing blue jeans and a blue jacket. She advised that he was standing on the first platform of the Monon High Bridge, approximately 50 feet from her. She advised she turned around at the bridge and continued her walk. She advised approximately halfway between the bridge and the parking area across the Mears Farm, she passed two girls walking toward Monon High Bridge. She advised that she believed the girls were Victim 1 and Victim 2. Video from the Hoosier Harvest Store shows at 1.49 uh, p.m., a white car matching Kelsey German's vehicle traveling away from the entrance across from the Mears farm. Betsy advised that she finished her walk and saw no other adults other than the male on the bridge. Her vehicle is seen on the Hoosier Harvest Store video at 2.14 p.m., leaving westbound from the trails. Betsy advised when she was leaving, she noted a vehicle was parked in an odd manner at the old CPS building. She said it was not odd for vehicles to be parked there, but she noticed it was odd because of the manner that it was parked, backed in or near the building. Investigators received a tip from Terry Wilson in which he stated that he was on his way to Delphi on State Road 25 around 2.10 p.m. on February 13, 2017. He observed a purple PT Cruiser, or a small SUV-type vehicle, parked on the south side of the old CPS building. He stated it appeared as though it was backed in as to conceal the license plate of the vehicle. Betsy and Terry both drew diagrams 
of where they saw the vehicle parked and their diagrams generally matched the area of the vehicle that was parked and the manner in which it was parked. Wesley McWhirter advised that he remembered seeing a smaller dark colored car parked at the old CPS building. He described it as possibly being a smart car. McWhirter's vehicle is seen leaving at 2.28 p.m. on the Hoosier Harvestor video. Okay, I just quickly want to see something. Okay, we're on page three. Because we've read through all of this before. I just want to see... This is what I'm trying to get to. Mm-hmm, there. That's very important. <laughs> There you go, April 14th. So we are going to get to it. I'm just making sure. I'm just double checking. Okay, going back up to page three. I like to read everything. You, If you know me at all, you know. <laughs> Cherry says, after the long dead court, for you to <laughs> read us Idaho, not Idaho docs, even Delphi docs. After 3 a.m., your time is pure dedication. <laughs> Thank you so much. Must have saved my voice, says Erin. You guys want me to skip to the part just to, I don't know. Save my voice. We're on page three. Let's go. Let's go. We can do it. Unless you don't want me to read it all. <laughs> Dragonfly lady says, why now? Okay, so let's continue on. I'm going to keep going. Investigators spoke with Sarah Car Carbaugh. How do we say her surname? Carbaugh. Carba? Who stated that she was traveling east on 300. We never heard these names before. She was traveling east on 300 North on February 13, 2022, and observed a male subject walking west on the north side of 300 North, away from the Monon High Bridge. I still find that so weird that he would do that, right? If, if that's him, if he's the one walking here, like, all muddy and bloody, what? Okay, so Sarah advised that the male subject was wearing a blue-colored jacket and blue jeans and was muddy and bloody. She further stated that it appeared he had gotten into a fight. Investigators were able to determine from watching the video from the Hoosier Harvest Store that Sarah... Carbar was traveling on CR 300 North at approximately 3.57 p.m. I just want to add that, you know, it's very possible that he really was like a peeper, like a lurker. And he was watching these girls and, you know, maybe, again, we're not victim blaming. We're trying to understand the situation. Maybe these two girls were like taking photos of, they did, you know, selfies of each other and everything. And then giggled at him or something. And I think at this point, based on everything we've known in the timeline, he may have been struggling with alcoholism. I think so. So imagine if he's in a rage then or it just ticks him off or something. I just wonder because this is a very strange impulsive crime then by the sounds of it based on this rather than how spooky and dramatic Superintendent Dakota made it sound. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. But anyway, that's just my speculation. I, we don't know yet. I'm just reading what I'm... I'm just adding some thought as we go. So they say through... Interviews, electronic data, photographs, and video from the Hoosier Harvest Store investigators determined that there were other people on the trail that day after 2.13 p.m. Those people were interviewed, and none of those individuals encountered the male subject referenced above, witnessed by the juvenile girls, Betsy Blair and Sarah Carbaugh. Further, none of those individuals witnessed victim 1 and 2. Investigators reviewing prior tips encountered a tip narrative from an officer who reviewed Richard, Richard M. Allen in 2017. Oh, man, he was always like, they reviewed him. That narrative stated, Mr. Allen was on the trail between 1.30 and 3.30. He parked at the old Farm Bureau building and walked to the new Freedom Bridge. While at the Freedom Bridge, he saw three females. He noted one was taller and had brown or black hair. He did not remember the description, nor did he speak with them. He walked through the Freedom Bridge to the High Bridge. He did not see anybody, although he stated he was watching a stock ticker on his phone as he walked. Right. Okay, he stated there... There were vehicles parked at the High Bridge trailhead, however, did not pay attention to them. He did not take any photos or video. His cell phone did not list an IMEI, but did have the following, and there's all the numbers. Identification of the phone, right? So then they say, potential follow-up information. Who were the three girls walking in the area of Freedom Bridge? <laughs> potential follow-up information. Who's Richard Allen, who was dressed just like the dude that was on the bridge in that photo? Five years later, right? Investigators believe Mr. Allen was referring to the former Child Protective Services building as there was not a Farm Bureau building in the area, nor had there been, which we've already gone over. There actually was at some point. But anyway, going on. 
Investigators believe the females he saw included RV, BW, and AS due to the time that they were leaving the trail, the time he reported getting to the trail, and the descriptions the three females gave. Investigators discovered Richard Allen owned two vehicles in 2017, a 2016 Black Ford Focus and a, 20, a 2006 Grey Ford 500. We're halfway, don't worry guys. Investigators observed a vehicle that resembled Allen's 2016 Ford Focus on the Hoosier Harvestor video at 1.27pm, traveling westbound on CR300 North in front of the Hoosier Harvestor, which coincided with his statement that he arrived around 1.30pm at the trails. Investigators note witnesses described the vehicle parked at the former CPS building as a PT Cruiser, a small SUV or a smart car. Investigators believe that those descriptions are similar in nature to a 2016 Ford Focus. Are they? Are they car people in chat? Anyway, <laughs> on October 13th, 2022, Richard Allen was interviewed again by investigators. He advised that he was on the trails on February 13, 2017. He stated that he saw juvenile girls on the trails east of Freedom Bridge and that he went onto the Monon High Bridge. Richard Allen further stated that he went out onto the Monon High Bridge to watch the fish. So one minute he's looking at his stock ticker, the next minute he's watching the fish. Later in his statement, he said he walked out, mm, out to the first platform on the bridge. He stated he then walked back, sat on a bench on the trail and left. He stated he parked his car on the side of an old building. He told investigators that he was wearing blue jeans and a blue or black Carhartt jacket with a hood. He advised he may have been wearing some type of head covering as well. Like he literally said it all. He literally said it. <laughs> he further claimed that he saw no one else except for the juvenile girls that he saw east of Freedom Bridge. Like the guy literally talked to them and told them all of this. In hindsight, I know hindsight's twenty twenty. He told investigators that he owns firearms and they are at his home. <laughs> Richard M. Allen's wife, Kathy Allen, also spoke to investigators. She confirmed that Richard did have guns and knives at the residence. She also stated that Richard still owns a blue Carhartt jacket. Unbelievable. On October 13, 2022, investigators executed a search warrant of Richard Allen's residence at 1967 North Whiteman Drive, Delphi, Carroll County, Indiana. So close to the bridge, the school and everything even the police station, and he worked at the CVS. Among other items, officers located jackets, boots, knives, and firearms, including a Sig Sauer Model P226 40 caliber pistol with serial number U625627. Between October 14, 2022 and October 19, 2022, the Indiana State Police Lab performed an analysis of Allen's Sig Sauer Model P226. The lab performed a physical examination and classification of the firearm. Function test, barrel, and overall length measurement. Test, this is the stuff that the defense wants um, thrown out. That's why I'm reading this to you again as well. Okay, see this? So this is some strong, strong evidence they have, but maybe now... I wonder if that's why the defense is like, okay, throw this out now that you have him on the phone confessing to his wife. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because damn. It seems like evidence is stacking up, right? NEP says a Focus is a small sedan and is also rounded, but not too close to the PTC. So then they say, um, test firing ammunition, okay, wait, 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 let's start that sentence again. The lab performed a physical examination and classification of the firearm, function test, barrel, and overall length measurement. Test firing, ammunition, component characterization, microscopic comparison, and NIBIN. The lab determined the unspent round located within two feet of victim 2's body had been cycled through Richard M. Allen's six-hour model 226. The lab remarked, an identification opinion is reached when the evidence exhibits an agreement of class characteristics and a sufficient agreement of individual marks. Sufficient agreement is related to the significant duplication of random striated impressed marks as evidenced by the correspondence of a pattern or combination of patterns of surface contours. A lot of people say this could be thrown out as junk science. I don't know. Sometimes they do that. Sometimes it seems pretty accurate. So, the interpretation of identification is subjective in nature and based on relevant scientific research and the reporting examiner's training and experience. Investigators then ran the firearm and found that the firearm was purchased by Richard Allen in 2001. Richard Allen voluntarily came to the Indiana State Police post on October 26, 2022. We're on page 5 of 8, in case you wonder. 
He spoke with investigators and stated that he never allowed anyone to use or borrow the 6-hour Model 22, P226 firearm. When asked about the unspent bullet, he did not have an explanation of why the bullet was found between the bodies of victim 1 and 2. He again admitted that he was on the trail but denied knowing victim 1 or victim 2 and denied any involvement in their murders. Carroll County Sheriff's Department Detective Tony Liggett has been part of the investigation since it started in 2017. I oh, know. We all look. <laughs> we all looked at him. We looked at uh, Tobe Lesenby. We've been looking at everybody <laughs> that's been at the press conferences, that's been at the forefront, that's been everyone possible, right? So then they say he hasn't had an opportunity to review and examine evidence gathered in this investigation. Detective Liggett, along with other investigators, believe the evidence gathered shows that Richard Allen is the male subject seen on the video from victim 2's phone who forced the victims down the hill. Further, that the victims were forced down the hill by Richard Allen and led to the location where they were murdered. Through the statements and photographs of the juvenile females and the statement of Betsy Blair, RV, BW and AS, were at the southeast edge of the trail at 12.43 p.m., east of the Freedom Bridge at 1.26 p.m., and walked across the former railroad overpass over Old State Road, 25, after 1.26 p.m. and before 1.46 p.m. They walked the entirety of the trail and observed only one person, an adult male. Betsy Blair's vehicle is seen on Hoosier Harvest Store video. Am I saying it right now, you guys? Do I sound like a local yet? <laughs> Everyone corrected me last time. Who's your harvest all video at 1.46 p.m. and leaving at 2.14 p.m. And she stated she only saw one adult male, RV, BW, AS, and Betsy Blair described the male in similar manners, wearing similar clothing, leading investigators to believe all four saw the same individual. Investigators believe the male observed by Betsy Blair, RV, BW, and AS is the same male depicted in the video from victim 2's phone due to the descriptions of the male by the four females matching the male in the video. Furthermore, victim 2's video was taken at 2.13 p.m. and Betsy Blair saw only one male while she was on the trail from approximately 1.46 p.m. to 2.14 p.m. Investigators believe that Richard Allen was the male seen by Betsy Blair, RV, BW and AS and the male seen in victim 2's video. Richard Allen told investigators he was on the trail from 1.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. that day. It's like literally everything right in front of their face, right? Video from Hoosier Harvest Store shows a vehicle that matches the description of Richard Allen's vehicle passing at 1.27 p.m. toward the former CPS building. The clothing he told investigators he was wearing matched the clothing of the male in victim to his video. And the clothing descriptions provided by Betsy Blair, RV and BW and AS, everything they said also matches. A vehicle matching the description of his 2016 Ford Focus is seen at around 2.10 p.m. 2.14 p.m. and 2.28 p.m. at the former CPS building. Through his own admissions, Richard Allen walked the trails and eventually hiked to the Monon High Bridge and walked out onto the Monon High Bridge. A male subject matching Richard Allen's description was not seen on the trail after 2.13 p.m. Investigators identified other individuals on the trails or CR 300 North between 2.30 and 4.11 p.m. None of those individuals saw a male subject matching the description of Richard Allen on the trail. Furthermore, Richard Allen stated that he only saw three girls on the trail, who investigators believe to be RV, BW, and AS. We're on page 6 of 8, you guys. <laughs> Lex Lux says, it's been in their face, G. Mm. <laughs> it's probably been in their face. It's like he was right there. So... Investigators believe Richard Allen was not seen on the trail after 2.13 p.m. because he was in the woods with victim 1 and 2. An unspent 40 caliber round between the bodies of victim 1 and 2 was forensically determined to have been cycled through Richard Allen's 6 hour Model P226. The 6 hour Model P226 was found at Richard Allen's residence and he admitted to owning it. Investigators were able to determine that he has owned it since 2001. Richard Allen stated that he had not been on that property where the unspent round was found and that he did not know the property owner and that he had no explanation as to why a round cycled through his firearm would be at that location. Furthermore, he stated that he never allowed anyone to use or borrow the 6-hour model P226. Investigators believe that after the victims were murdered, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down CR 300 North. 
Investigators believe that he was seen by Sarah Carver walking back to his vehicle on CR 300 North with clothes that were muddy and bloody. I don't know how you tell the difference between mud and blood at those times. Also quickly looking when you're driving past, but I'm not saying anything about the witness. I'm just like, I wonder how, you know? Okay, so Tony Liggett, along with investigators, believe the statements made by the witnesses because the statements corroborate the timeline of the death of the two victims as well as coincide with the admissions made by Richard Allen. Further, the accounts relayed by Betsy Blair, RV, BW, AS are similar in nature and timestamps on photographs taken by BW correspond to the times the juvenile females said they were on the trail and saw the male individual. Investigators believe that Richard M. Allen committed this kidnapping, which resulted, which result, that's very interesting, the wording there as well, which resulted in the killing of victim one and two. Still, we ask, are there any others involved? From their prior conclusions, investigators believe Richard M. Allen was the male depicted in victim two's video, saying guys down the hill. They believe Richard M. Allen was carrying his six hour model P226 on that day due to the cycled round matching that firearm that was located within feet of victim 2's body. They further believe he was carrying the 6 hour model P226 from the audio from victim 2's video, in which investigators believe they hear the sound of a gun being cycled and one of the victims mentioning a gun. Investigators believe after that time, victim 1 and 2 were removed from the bridge by Richard to where their murders occurred. You see, that language is still very interesting. Charges were filed against Richard M. Allen on October 28, 2022, for two counts of murder. Once Richard M. Allen was taken into custody, he was moved to the Westville Correctional Facility. We went over the code, the open murder charges that he has, which we speculated before could mean the kidnapping that led to their murder. Maybe that's because that would be an easier one to prove in a court of law, because they've got the video, they've got the audio, they've got all that, right? So maybe that's why. I just still wonder, don't we all wonder if there's anyone else involved at all? So, to continue on, we're almost there. We've gone over all of this before. <laughs> we're going over it one more time. So, here we go. So, it says, investigators believe that uh, after that time, victim one and two were removed from the bridge by Richard to where their murders occurred. Charges were filed against him on October 28th, in case you guys missed it, 2022, for two counts of murder. Once Richard M. Allen was taken into custody, he was moved to the Westville Correctional Facility, now this gets him interesting, which is part of the Indiana Department of Corrections for safekeeping. He's been in said facility since November 2022. When Richard M. Allen entered the facility, he was placed in the segregation unit for his protection. So thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate it. Please like, share, hashtag Libby and Abby, hashtag Richard Allen, hashtag Delphi, Hashtag Grizzly True Crime. These are all very helpful hashtags. It's not like I'm just making up hashtags. They really help to categorize the information all in one place. So if you share it on Twitter, for example, and you say hashtag Delphi, hashtag Grizzly True Crime, Libby and Abby, Richard Allen, all the ones I just said, it'll categorize it really nicely. And then I can easily retweet as well, especially if you tag me in it. So, yes. Thank you that we could go through this document together. There are so many more. In fact, I wish I could show you. Look at all these documents that were just unsealed. You see all that? I don't even think that... Is that even... It says 118 items. Oh, yes. So many documents. I'm sure some of them would be a little bit less interesting than others. I think the one we read was the most interesting. So, I will see you tomorrow. Stay safe. Sleep tight. Whatever time it is for you. It's almost 2 in the morning for me. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs>